we spoke about the value of teaching students, as it says in the first paragraph of the, of the Shema, the shinantum lovanecho the daber bom. You should teach your children, and as the Midrash tells us, children means doesn't mean your biological children or your halachic children, but it means your students. As we find the Rambam cites a verse that we find that the students of the prophets were called B'nai Hanavim, because they were mentored to be prophets by the prophet, therefore they're called the children of the Nevi'im, although they were only their students. So from there we, we draw that what it says in the Shema, you should teach your students, your children, it means your children, your students. And what is the value of teaching your students? And you teach them, it has to be in a context that it's with a sharpness, with a clarity, meaning whatever subject you're teaching, you have to have mastered that subject. It has to be deliberate and communicated with a cogency. Because if the student himself doesn't appreciate what's being transmitted, the transmission is questioned whether it's going to go beyond that point. But if you're able to impact and impress upon that student the value of, of that information that's being communicated, then you've actually you've succeeded in your objective of being that teacher to mentor that student to be the equivalent of your son. I had mentioned my Shiva always would cite the Alt of Slavotka from Nosson C. Finkel, Zech Tzarek was the mentor of all the great graduates of the Slavotki Shiva at the earlier part of the 20th century. He says, if the Torah means that you teach your students, why speak in a context which is ambiguous? Be, be very specific. Teach your students. It says, Bonecho, your sons, and it was transmitted at Sinai, part of the oral law, when it says, Bonecho, Bonecho means Talmidecho, it means your students. Why is the term more explicit? So I mentioned that the Alt of Slavotka says that just as a father, his level of dedication to his son is where he doesn't leave a stone unturned. And he will do everything to make sure that that child or that son appreciates and understands what's being communicated. Identically, that has to be the level of commitment and dedication of a teacher to a Talmud, to a student. No less. Only when you have that level of dedication, only then do you merit that special siyata dishmayo, that divine assistance, not only to be able to communicate it, but the student should be a beneficiary of what you communicate to him. But it has to be with that level of dedication, no less than a parent to a child, which is the ultimate level. The inflammatory uses the term bonecho rather than tamidecho. Rambam in the laws of Talmud Torah writes that kol chochom v'chochom chayov lulamides talmidim that if a person has a mastery in Torah, in whatever area, whether it's Chumash, whether it's Talmud, whether it's Mishnah, you have an obligation to impart, impart that knowledge to the Talmudim, to the students. But that's the language of Ramam. Kol chocham v'chocham Yisrael. Every chocham, every scholar among the Jewish people is obligated, obliged, the Lame Esa Talmidim. You have an obligation to teach the students. So I ask the question. It should say, you're obligated to teach Ben Chavero, your fellow son. You're only a student once you've studied. You know, a person goes to one class of a teacher or a lecturer. I'm a student of so-and-so. What, 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 how are you a student? You haven't learned anything from it. After you've learned, you become a student. But the Ramab says, no, if you are chocham, if you have that level of knowledge, you have an obligation to impart it to students. But there are only students afterwards, not prior. 
So the way I understood it was a father has an obligation to teach his child, even if his child is not interested in, in learning or studying, he cannot leave a stone unturned to convince that son and impress upon him the importance of Torah. A third party who is a Talmud Chacham who has Torah knowledge, even though he mastered his subject matter, if the student is agreeable and open to study, you have to actually impart that knowledge to him. If he wants to be a student, let's say he has no interest. Your obligation is not as a Chacham to impress upon that person, to convince him to study Torah. That's a separate discussion. That's the mitzvah of what? Of Kol Yisrael Ravenzel was it. Jews are responsible for one another. You don't have to be a Chacham to have the obligation to convince and, and impress upon a person the importance of studying Torah. That's every Jew has that obligation. All Jews are responsible for one another. The obligation of a Chacham, of a Tam Chacham, a Torah scholar, to impart his knowledge, that's only Chayv Laban is a Talmidim. If you're agreeable to be a student, I'm obligated to mentor you, to impart the knowledge I have. Therefore, the Ramam says, Lalabed is a Talmidim, to teach the students. Shinatim Lavanecho. So we understand that if the student wants to be the student, he wants to be the recipient of the knowledge that you want to impart, then the level of dedication between the teacher and the student has to be no less than the dedication of a father to a son. And only then, as I said, do you merit that divine intervention that you should be effective and the child should not be affected. You know, many years ago, the first time I was going to meet the person I mentioned many times, the professed atheist. So people would said to me, knowing I was going there to meet him, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think? I said, I have no idea. I said, if I have the merit and he has the merit, I will succeed. If I have the merit, he doesn't have the merit, I'm not going to succeed. And if he has the merit, I don't have the merit to press upon him. What I'm meant to press upon him, I'm not going to succeed. So everything has to be in place. He has to have the merit. I have to have the merit. That what I impart to him, it should impress him that he should embrace it. But if any po component is not there, it's not going to work. What's going to be? I said, whatever's meant to be is going to be. That's what I shared with people before I went to the first meeting. When I met him, I'd never met the person before. That was my first encounter with that person. Now, I mentioned yesterday in the middle of the Midrash, the Midrash asks a question, says that if the Jews already accepted Torah unequivocally, why did Torah have to put a, a mountain over their heads? That was the question the Midrash asks. And the Midrash answers that initially, when the Jews accepted Torah unequivocally, that was the written law. Was the written law are just generalities? It's just the observance of the mitzvah, of the commandments. But really, to understand the oral meaning, the elucidation of that material, and to extrapolate an application to other situations, unless you're willing to give up and compromise on your physicality, on all the pleasures of life, the amenities of life, you're not going to have the means, the ability to process that information, to merit God's divine assistance, to give you an understanding of what that's all about. Because he cited a verse in Kohelis that King Solomon says that the Torah is found in the land of the dead. What does it mean, the land of the dead? It's the land of the living. No. Only if you're willing to forfeit all the amenities of the living, only then do you have relevance to Torah. It's recent. In last week's reading, we read something very interesting. Moshe Rabbeinu is reprimanding the Jews, admonishing them for all the failings over the years. One of them was the story of the golden calf. Here he's in heaven, spending 40 days and 40 nights studying the Torah. And he's bringing down the first set of tablets. And God says to Moshe, your people have become corrupted. 
go down. He goes down, he sees the golden calf, he takes the tablets, he smashes them. Then he goes up for another 40 days and 40 nights, supplicates Hashem for forgiveness, he forgives them. Goes up another 40 days and 40 nights to study Torah and receive the second set of tablets, which was an indication of full reinstatement. The Jews were fully reinstated to be God's people, and they were given the commandment to build the Mishkan. Now the relationship is arm's length. It's the medium through the Mishkan we have a relation with God. That's what we read in last week's reading. Moshe Rabbeinu says, when I ascended the 40 days and 40 nights the first time to study the Torah and receive the tablets, Moshe shares with them, Lechem lo maim lo During that 40-day period, I did not eat bread. I did not drink water. And then when he went up again for the second set of tablets, again, 40 days and 40 nights, again, he repeats it. During the last 40 days, Lechem lo maim lo I did not eat bread. I did not drink water. So the question is, why is this an important piece of information that we should know that the first time he ascended for the 40 days, 40 nights to receive the first tablets to study the Torah, he tells us, I did not eat bread or drink water. And again, for the second tablets, again, repeating the same thing. What's, why is that so important? So the Midrash answers that what Moshe is saying to the Jewish people is this. The only reason why I was qualified and I was the receptacle to receive the Torah because Masarti Domi Since I did not eat, I did not drink, I compromised my physicality. And because I was willing to compromise and wean myself from physicality, therefore I had the capacity to receive the Torah's entirety. During this 40-day period, when he after the first tablets were broken, he had to be restudy the Torah again. And again, 40 days and 40 nights, I did not eat bread, did not eat, drink water. Again, again, re-emphasize, reiterating the same thing. To be qualified to be the receptacle and to merit the divine assistance, to be able to have the capacity to process and grasp the concepts and, and the application of those concepts, the more you negate your physical being and you compromise on that, you have a greater capacity to succeed. That's the Midrash. We read at the beginning of the portion of Dvarim, which is the first portion in the book of Dvarim, where Yisro, who was the father of Moshe, criticized Moshe for adjudicating all the cases of the Jewish people. He says, don't you realize you're going to wither? I suggest you set up a judicial system. And what? And who should be the judges? You need Chachomim, you need wise men, scholars, Nevonim, he, he said a number of prerequisites which qualifies the judge to be the judge. The Jews jumped at it. They said to Moshe, great idea. What do you have to bother? So Moshe Rabbeinu, he's rebuking, he says, let me ask you a question. Who is it better to study from? A person who sacrificed the Torah, Rashi cites the Midrash, or a person who did not sacrifice. I... I sacrificed for the Torah. Because I spent 40 days and 40 nights, I did not eat bread, I did not drink water. My students, the ones I transmitted to, they never sacrificed for the Torah the way I did. So who is it better to study Torah from? From the teacher who sacrificed or the students who did not sacrifice? But yet you jumped at it. You jumped at the suggestion, you don't have to bother me. Why? Because you know that I know what they don't know. Me, you know you can't bribe. I'm not bribable. The other people, you know, you bring them a gift. Rabbi, by the way, here's a, a nice cigarette case with gold with your name engraved on it. I'll get you a beautiful talus with a silver, you know, a collar. They'll think you're God's gift right off the mountain. And the rabbi will be impressed with this. With me, there's no nonsense. Therefore, you jumped at it. But what the, the difficulty is, Moshe, Moshe should have said to them, who's it better to study from? A person who studied directly from God 
or a person who studied from a mortal. Moshe doesn't say that. Is it better to study from a person who sacrificed and toiled or a person who did not? I mean, seemingly what he should have said is, my teacher is God. Your teacher is me. I'm a mortal. So there's no comparison. But Moshe didn't say that. The answer is the only reason why Moshe had the capacity to be the receptacle and the repository for the Torah which God communicated to him because he sacrificed. Because he did not eat bread or drink water for 40 days and 40 nights and because he weaned himself from physicality, that's the reason why he had the capacity. It wasn't because God taught him, but rather because of his physical state. Now, in the first paragraph of the Shema, we say, you should love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your material. All your money. Money does only money. It means all the pleasures of life, all the amenities of life. How many people are willing to give that up? The answer is you count them on one hand, relatively speaking. As a result of that's the reason why it's written in the singular. In the singular, the second paragraph is speaking of the average Jew. Special Jews the righteous, even Hasidim, but the willingness to give up the basic amenities of life for the sake of toiling in Torah, they're not willing. Therefore, with all your heart, yes. With all your, even give your lives, yes. In the plural. But not with all your material. With all your material needs, amenities, that you're not willing. The flesh of life, you're not willing. You know, I need those eight square hours of sleep. I need, you know, I need that special wardrobe. I need that special menu served. I need my table set a certain way. You know, my mattress commissioned, custom made. You know, that uh, King Tut in his mummy forms has been lying on it for thousands of years. That's how comfortable that mattress is. You know, you go to the Museum of Natural History, you'll see, you'll see the vet he's sleeping. He's lying in. Okay? You, you have to be willing to give that all up. If you're willing to give that up, then you have relevance. That's the first paragraph. Then you have relevance to Toshim al to the oral law. Because it takes that level of sacrifice to come upon its truth. The second paragraph is not speaking to that same person. The Jews weren't willing to put themselves in a position to forego all the pleasures of life, permitted pleasures. God says the only way you could acquire the Torah in its full realm of clarity, you have to be willing to make that sacrifice. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You're not going to succeed. Marashim Zechariah Vrocha told me, blessed memory, he studied in the Slavotki Shiva during World War One. During World War One, in Lithuania, they barely had what to eat. He said the bread had more sand in it than flour. That's how that's how impure the bread was. So he said, and they had and they had hot water. They provided. They were like they called it a samovar on all the corners. In Lithuania, there were big samovars, and you had hot water. So you had this bread, which is barely edible, and you had hot water. He said those years were the best years they studied in Slabotka. When they would they were deprived, they had barely anything. Those were the best years. That, that's what he shared with me. Meaning, if you're pampered, relatively speaking, pampered, you need that amenity. You need, need that time out. You need this, you need that. When there's no time out, you have the focus and you feel your own, spiritually speaking, because you've been, you've been stripped of all the physical distractions because it, it doesn't exist. There's nothing. As a result of that, your acuity for spirituality and your capacity to another level. That's what it is. I can tell you you know, when I first came to Yeshiva in the old neighborhood, the only room that was air-conditioned was the base Medrash. 
The classrooms were not air conditioned. The dormitory was not air conditioned. In the winter, very often the heat didn't work. And in the winter, after 10.30, in the base bench, they shut the heat off to save money. Of course, money had, had great value and they didn't have much of it. When you went to a lecture in those years, a lecture was an hour and 45 minutes, six days a week. Today, a lecture in every yeshiva is between 50 minutes and an hour maximum. Whole different reality of tension span. Today, every room in every yeshiva is air conditioned. If the air, air conditioning goes on a blink, students can't learn. We studied in the summertime. And if you're in Baltimore in the summer, you think, I don't, you don't have to have a built-in sauna in your house. The whole environment, the climate, it's right off the Chesapeake Bay. It's, it's just, you can't, you can't understand how hot it is. But we sat 45, hour 45 minutes every day in the summer, listening to that lecture in depth. And we may, we may do, and we succeeded. And the level of success in those years are greater than the level of success today. No distractions. The bread we ate, because the ship would receive bread without payment, because they had a, an agreement with a commission bakery that if they buy the challah for shops and pay for it, the bread that was returned to the commission bakery, the commission bakery would give it to the ship without cost, without payment. Yeah, That means we ate bread that was minimally two to three days old. That's the day, bread we ate every day. But Shabbos, we looked something local, we had fresh challah from Shabbos. Was that the yeshiva paid for? But those years were phenomenal years of learning. No distraction. No credit cards. You know, you didn't have the restaurants there. You didn't like the food, you went to a restaurant. It didn't exist. It was a different reality. Therefore, there's no b'chol ma'otchem. When we speak to the masses, the average person is not willing or cannot give that up. The first paragraph speaks to the select few, the ones who have the ability to compromise on their pleasures of life, even basic amenities, for the sake of what? Of the big prize, which is the Torah itself. Therefore, the first paragraph is in the singular. Second paragraph is in the plural. In the plural, there's no Mechom Otchem. There's not with all your monetary, all your material. It's not. There's something interesting. In the second paragraph, it says that if you follow my mitzvahs and you heed them with all your hearts and all, all your souls, the rains will come in in their times and the, the land will give its bounty. And you'll be able to go safted to go necho. You're going to gather in the grain, the wine, the olives. That's what's going to be. Then all of a sudden, we say in the second paragraph of the Shema, You have to be careful that you should not be seduced by your hearts. Why? Because if you're seduced by hearts, because you're going to end up doing idolatry. So the obvious question is, we're talking about a person, what kind of Jew are we talking to? A Jew, if you will heed and observe my mitzvahs, with all your hearts and with all your lives, which is your souls, the rain will come, you'll have bounty, you'll bring in the harvest. And then Hashem says, He shamrulochem, you have to be extra careful. Because if you're going to be seduced by your souls, by your hearts, you're going to become idolaters. We're talking about you're on your apex level on top of the mountain. But if you're seduced by your heart, you realize we can end up, you'll end up being an idolater. You ever hear such a thing? How, how is this possible? Here you're at the most advanced level. But if you allow your hearts to be seduced, you have to be careful. You will serve alien gods. And the wrath of Hashem will come upon you. And everything will change to the negative. 
Why is that the case? You know, there's an expression, each man has his price. If you want to bribe a person, could you imagine a person, he's a man of status, a man of accomplishment, and he earns $150,000 salary. And you want to bribe him $5,000. He would react very badly to it. How do you bribe me? Don't you realize I'm a government official? I'm in a position, you know? He'll slap the man down in a second. Dismiss him, even threatening him to what? To have him prosecuted. What about if he comes and says, you know, something, I want to make you an offer. A half a billion dollars. You won't have to work forever. You can buy yourself an island somewhere who knows where. We'll give you a new identity and start over a new life. He says, now you're talking. Now there's what to consider. As they say, each man has his price. You have to know how to buy a person, how to bribe a person. There's nobody who knows how to play the fiddle better than the evil inclination. He could weave a tapestry, which is so unbelievable, and convince you that night is day and day is night. He has that level of, of genius. Now, who is bribable? Who could be seduced? A person who has relevance to what that seduction is. Let's say you have a person. He lives a life where he's, he's actually given up all the pleasures of life. He's removing himself from all the amenities. He has no interest in that. And you say, you know something, I'll buy a, a 20 course meal. You're talking to the wrong guy. I'll give you that kind of money. Material has no value. As a result of that, there's nothing to talk about. The first paragraph of the Shema was speaking to a person, a person's willing to give it all up, even the material. There's no entry point. The evil inclination doesn't have an entry point there. Since there's no entry point, he's not bribable. The second paragraph, we're talking about a person who has an interest in the material. He's only willing to sacrifice his heart, his life. He's not willing to give up the pleasures of life. The evil inclination knows who he's talking to. It's just a question how to bribe him, how to entice him, how to seduce him. Therefore, the second paragraph speaks about you have to be extra careful. But since you're not willing to give up the amenities of life, the pleasures, therefore, I have to forewarn you where ultimately this can end up. Therefore, don't allow him even to approach it. He him. You have to be careful not to be seduced. Because if you, the moment you allow yourself to be seduced, you never know where it can end up.